hidden away among the many splendors of Venice is a small clue to one of the most astonishing tales of adventure in all financial history. To the honor and memory of John Law of Edinburgh, most distinguished controller of the treasury of the kings of the French. This is the final resting place of the man who invented the stock market bubble. An ambitious Scot, a convicted murderer, a compulsive gambler, and a flawed financial genius, he not only caused the first true boom and bust in asset prices, he also indirectly caused the French Revolution. There was a time when John Law owned a quarter of what is now the United States, only to lose it all in history's first great crash. From Edinburgh to Amsterdam to Paris, all the way here to New Orleans, and finally to Venice, Law's story is a classic tale of boom and bust. It's also very much a story for our own times. Hidden away here in the warehouse of the Louisiana State Museum is the only known painting of John Law. Here he is. With that lean and hungry look, he really is for all the world a Scotsman on the make. The path that led Law from obscurity to celebrity to notoriety is a path that many of the great stock market players have followed since. Law was born here in Edinburgh in 1671, the son of a successful goldsmith and heir to the estate of Lauriston. In 1694, while living in London, Law killed a man in a duel over a woman and was sentenced to death. Somehow, Law managed to escape from prison and fled to Amsterdam. He couldn't have picked a better town to lie low in. By the 1690s, Amsterdam was the world capital of financial innovation. To help finance their war against Spain, the Dutch had introduced one of the world's first national lotteries. To protect their merchants from dodgy coinage, they'd created the world's first central bank. But the one that had the biggest impact on law was the single greatest Dutch invention of them all, the company. To John Law, lying low in Amsterdam, having escaped the gallows in London, the workings of the Dutch East India Company came as a revelation. Law was living off his winnings at the gambling table but he was fascinated by the relationships between the company with its splendid offices in the Hoogstraat, the nearby stock exchange where dealers busily traded the company's shares, and the Bank of Amsterdam. Yet this Dutch financial system struck law as not quite complete. To Law's financially supercharged mind, the Dutch were missing a trick or two. For one thing, it seemed completely nuts to restrict the number of East India Company's shares when the markets were so clearly enamoured of them. Law was also puzzled by the conservatism of the Bank of Amsterdam. It had created an internal system which allowed merchants to settle their accounts by direct cashless transfers, but it hadn't issued any real banknotes to the public. The idea was already taking shape of a breathtaking modification of the institutions that Law had first encountered here in Amsterdam. Only combine the properties of a monopoly trading company and a public bank, and the sky really would be the limit. Law was preparing to unleash a whole new system of finance on an unsuspecting nation. 